Welcome to the lecture on 5G physical layer. Uh, my name is uh, Antti Toskala, coming from uh, Nokia uh, Standards and Technology Unit, uh, based here in Espoo, Finland. And uh, I will be taking you through this uh, 5G physical layer, uh, what it's all about, and uh, what is also a little bit coming in the future as the next development steps. So first of all, here is this uh, structure of today's uh, lecture. Uh, we'll be going through different areas of the physical layer, starting from the ski technology components, compare a bit what's the difference between 3G and 4G, and, uh, and, and then go through these different uh, elements, waveforms, frame structures, channel coding, and, and so forth. Uh, finalizing with this uh, small talk about uh, what is the current availability in terms of devices, what do they support and what do they don't. And uh, on the picture on the right hand side is then the reference uh, material, so commercial part of the presentation. So the book written by, by not only myself, but uh, many, many Nokia colleagues, as well as colleagues from some other companies like uh, MediaTek, Skyworks, Entity Docomo, uh, that uh, bring the uh, expertise of 5G together. Uh, if you look at the 5G radio technology, so what was new compared to the previous generations? So first of all, we had to deal with, uh, with elements like uh, new spectrum, meaning that uh, we were addressing higher frequency band than previous generations. Uh, on one hand, we were also from the day one putting a lot of emphasis on dealing with the beamforming, which of course, when you go to higher frequencies, antennas get smaller. Uh, then doing this kind of antenna arrays gets more realistic from size and cost point of view. So then the beamforming was now really taking into account from the day one of the, of the, of the radio interface design. Then this um, slicing flexibility meaning is that even though we define this kind of uh, radio with, uh, with, uh, with a massive uh, data rate and, and uh, capacity capabilities. We also took into account that the first of all, not every device may not be in the future needing, needing these several gigabits of data rates. We also need to be able to be flexible, the configure the system in, in different ways, including to operate in a situation that you don't have that much traffic, that you want to save energy, to be energy efficient to take these uh, current climate challenges into account. Further, we are now really dealing with the multi-connectivity, meaning that uh, with 5G, uh, we are in, we enable that we are connected together with the 4G LT connection as well as 5G connection. This kind of dual connectivity uh, we have practiced in the standards in the earlier generations, but now is a real first time that is really taken into use and is the baseline feature of all the devices you may already have in your pocket. If we now look, um, what is then difference to this 3G, 4G from the radio technology point of view? We, we can see elements uh, like take the waveform. 3G of course was totally different. Uh, uh, based on the uh, co-division multiple access CDMA. Now with 4G, we already took the off DMA into use uh, and we continue that with, with, with 5G. But uh, we of course add a lot of more flexibility as you later see in terms of parameterization where you can apply it low band, mid band, very high frequency band as, as, as well. Uplink waveform is another element. CDMA in 3G, uh, single carry FDMA in, 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 in the 4G side. And now we have also off DMA, autoconal frequency division multiple access together with the single carrier FDMA operation in uplink available. These technologies been suited for a little bit different needs. One suited for sellage operation when you're power limited, other one suited for multi-stream uplink transmission when you have more link budget available. Uh, channel coding was something that uh, between 3G and 4G, we only applied basically copy and paste, nothing major changes. Uh, but uh, 
but now with the, with the 5G, with the increase of data rates, challenges with the power consumption in the handset as well, we had to take something more efficient. So we took the LDPC low density parity check codes into use. Technology known from, be that from these space missions, be that from Wi-Fi, but we did improve it, make it more flexible, more, uh, uh, more advanced compared to these uh, previous generations of low density parity check coding. Uh, Beamforming, uh, 3G did not really consider that in, in, in reality, uh, 4G only partly, but now we have full support starting from the initial access as we discuss shortly. And from the spectrum point of view, uh, previous generations were typically limited to 3G up to this uh, couple of 2 gigahertz range, uh, 4G went up to this uh, uh, 6 gigahertz if you take the unlicensed into account. But now with the 5G, in the first phase we have done the support around the 50 gigahertz range, now working even higher and, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll soon enable up to 71 gigahertz. So clearly a larger range of spectrum could be utilized. And, and that naturally is linked to this uh, bandwidth we have uh, up to uh, 200 or even 400 megahertz bandwidth in, in the millimeter wave supported by the devices. And so additionally, we enable more energy efficient network operations, so really green networks. Uh, we are lower latency, faster decoding, shorter TTIs, transmission time intervals, as we see shortly. And uh, many solutions that we developed in LT standards, did not necessarily implement, but now they are really rolled in the field in practice with 5G. So let's have a look in some of those interesting ones in more details. Uh, for spectrum point of view, indeed, even if I say now that we are up to 50 gigahertz, 71 gigahertz short, of course, in the first phase, you need to build coverage and uh, that's why the low frequency bands come to the play. Uh, we have those frequency bands uh, like uh, 3.5 gigahertz as discussed shortly is, is really the major band also here in, in, in Finland and Europe in general, but also being rolled out in the US and Asia quite widely. And then this high frequency band then offer future capacity expansion. So if you take the 3.5 gigahertz band range as an example first, uh, so there typically an operator uh, has around 100 megahertz bandwidth. And that's something what all these first phase devices support. Every 5G device uh, in the market today, if they support this 3.5 gigahertz frequency range, they support 100 megahertz bandwidth, which is clearly uh, five times more than the, than the basic uh, LTE bandwidth. And that of course has a clear uh, direct linkage to this uh, data rates you are supporting. Uh, there are of course several existing LTE bands that have been specified as 5G bands. So over the years we will see reforming when operators will move more and more of their spectrum assets to be operated using 5G technology. Uh, this uh, millimeter wave bands, uh, 28 gigahertz range in Europe, you talk more maybe 26 gigahertz range, was not used earlier by the mobile communications. And now it's been rolled out, but still slowly. It's mainly in, in US, in Europe, you don't see much of that, if any. Like if you go and buy the latest iPhone in Europe, the versions don't support the millimeter wave. If you buy, the, buy a version in US, they do. So, so that's also a uh, clear indication that uh, in, in the other markets, those millimeter waves will come still later. So to be able to deal with this um, different sets of frequency band, you need a lot of flexibility in the system. And uh, to enable that, uh, we defined many different uh, subcarrier spacings and are, are defining even more in, in the standards for later releases. And, and that was that uh, 
For the low frequency bands, using the same as LTE, 15 kilohertz works well. But, uh, but then you have, if you want to do support larger bandwidths, then the amount of subcarriers you would need would tend to be quite large. And from the fundamentals of OFDMA technology, having very large uh, FFT sizes would not be ideal. So when you go to this uh, 100 megahertz bandwidth range, you want to use larger subcarrier spacing so that uh, uh, you don't need such a huge number of those subcarriers. Same time with OFDMA, when we increase the subcarrier spacing, our simple duration in time gets clearly shorter. So that means that uh, uh, we go down in latency as well, meaning that how long does it take to transmit, for example, the typical 14 symbols. With the 15 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, it takes one millisecond. When we go to 30 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, it takes only half a millisecond. And if we go all the way to this uh, 120 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, with this intended to the millimeter wave frequencies, it takes only one eighth of a millisecond to transmit. That, together with faster processing times, is a key for enabling uh, this kind of shorter uh, round trip times in, in, in 5G compared to the previous generations. Uh, then when we go to this millimeter wave, indeed, another issue comes that this uh, phase noise because becomes an issue so that uh, your frequency estimation is, is not necessarily so accurate anymore with the higher frequencies. That's why also the subcarrier spacing needs to be higher so you are able to cooperate, uh, deal with that, and, and you don't get uh, too much uh, interference between the subcarriers. Uh, that would be the case that if you try to operate 15 kilohertz subcarrier spacing on this 26 gigahertz frequency, for example. So then let's look at the waveforms next uh, as, a, as a next item. So, uh, so in, in release 16, indeed, we have the off DMA in both directions. In uplink, we have the single carrier option for, for the cell edge cases if you are, if you are, if you are limited with, with the power operation. The motivation for off DMA, both in uplink and downlink, was to be able to have a similar solution dealing with the interference handling, think about uh, side link communication. Side link communication is the communication between the handsets. And, uh, and OFDMA then allows this kind of efficient multiplexing of, uh, of, of uh, different services in, in frequency domain, which is then needed as part of the 5G operations. Uh, release 17 is addressing even further higher subcarrier spacing values as we are addressing especially the 60 to 71 gigahertz frequency bands that is mostly going to be unlicensed used but in some regions also licensed operation on that band but that clearly building for the future something that could expect to appear in the market maybe uh, end of 23 early 20, 2024 time frame and um, Currently, the discussion in 3GPP is that we don't likely go above 71 gigahertz as there are not new frequency bands now identified available for the 5G there. But um, some studies may be started uh, to look for new waveforms. Uh, of DMA with, with the very high frequencies is not necessarily going to be so attractive. So it may be more towards this kind of single carrier waveform type of considerations for very high frequencies when you go towards the above uh, 100 gigahertz and beyond. So now if you look at the frame structure of, of 5G compared what is the difference to LTE. Uh, first of all, similar to LTE, we support both FDD and TDD, frequency division duplex and time division duplex operations. Recall, with FDD, you had to separate part of the spectrum for uplink, separate for downlink, but with TDD, we were sharing them in, in time domain. Uh, now with this um, reference signal structure, with LTE, the reference signals are, so to say, all over the place. 
if you, if you, when you look the slide. Uh, that is to allow this kind of good uh, interpolation to create this um, channel estimate both in frequency and time domain. This is nice, but it has one major drawback, is that you need to receive the whole frame before you are able to create your channel estimation. And that's, that's only when you can start decoding your data. And that costs you in, in time. You introduce delay. With LTE, sorry, with 5G, the idea is that you have first your control signaling, then you have your reference data that allows you to build a channel estimate, and then you are able to do the data decoding straight from the beginning, which means that ideally you are done with your decoding almost when your data stops coming. Uh, this has some drawbacks naturally for an environment where you move a lot so that uh, uh, then the channel is changing too much. And in those cases, we do need to add additional reference signals to the end. And uh, that's why later when you see, when I saw something processing times, you see two, two values as this extra demolition reference signal. If that is in use, then of course device need to capture that one before you can do the real full channel estimate and start decoding your data. Channel coding was um, perhaps the most controversial element of first 5G design choices we had to do in, in 3GPP. Uh, one thing was that uh, also engineers dealing with this had been used with turbo coding since early days of 3G and that had been specified in 1999 and uh, now we were dealing with this, uh, 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 we had adopted the same solution basically for LT as well. And, and, and now was kind of a big decision to change the situation and take something else into use when everybody had been used to that turbo coding is what we are using. The problem with turbo coding was the fact that uh, devices with very high data rates would become really too hot in practice. And I don't need the hot in design, but from the temp temperature point of view. So we had to really have a cooler devices uh, so that uh, the channel coding solution could not use so much energy. Because that was the problem with turbo codes going up in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the data rates, more and more energy is consumed in decoding the data. That's why we were evaluating these different alternatives. And uh, we had also some choice, other choices like polar coding into consideration was very new, but it did not offer anything, uh, any real improvements over low density parity check codes, which were clearly superior in their energy efficiency and, uh, and, and, and provided a really good area efficiency as well that your chip surface area is not too massive to make the decoder. So then uh, low density parity check codes were chosen as the channel coding solution with, uh, with 5G. For the layer one control signaling, we, we do some other solutions, sometimes repetition, sometimes Fried Müller, or sometimes this polar coding. Uh, but for real device performance, of course, it's the, uh, it's, it's the actual channel coding that makes a difference. Low latency comes from multiple elements. One thing indeed is what I have described, that you are really able to send data quickly so that uh, uh, it doesn't take too long for data to travel over the, over the radio interface. But other element is that once the device receives the data, how long you need to process that before you can pass it on towards the upper layers and eventually for the application you're using. And now, with the solution described earlier, the decoding can be now clearly faster, like you can see in the picture in this easy case in, in the sense that uh, you have FTD, meaning uplink is all the time available. Already during the next uh, transmission time interval, you get the feedback for the uplink, 
whether your data was received correctly or not. And if it was received correctly, then of course device can push it on towards the high next layers in, in the protocol stack. Uh, if you compare with LTE, LTE was only done with the decoding some uh, uh, same time as with 5G, we, you, we would already have a retransmission available. So that shows a clear difference between LTE and 5G in this uh, latency performance, in the speed of decoding, as, as, as well as how fast you get the stuff over the air interface. Besides this 14 simple, we have also other means to make it even faster. So we have this concept called mini slot, which means that you don't have to allocate full 14 simples. You can allocate seven, four, or two simples, those called mini slot. And that again cuts time from, from the operations and, and can make the latency even smaller. Where would you need such a extreme latency? It doesn't matter if you're watching Netflix, uh, but uh, for this kind of applications in the industrial environment, for example, controlling the robots, machinery, this ultra reliable low latency communication, that is the field where it really makes a difference. Is the, is the air interface delay? Are you dealing with five milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, maybe 15 milliseconds that we get typical when we test LTE as of today? But, uh, but now we can go to this kind of one millisecond level or even, even smaller than that for best cases. There are more future-oriented structures in the specifications. One may, if you read the specifications or the book, you know these concepts like self-contained subframe, where uh, also the uplink feedback would be encapsulated, uh, already provided during the same, same frame where the downlink data came. Those are, of course, more for the future looking, not supported in the devices as of today in the marketplace, but uh, may come to the play in, in, in the future as also processing technology gets all the time faster and faster. So now if we move a bit for the next section of the story, meaning the beamforming. So what have we done in 5G? differently to earlier generations. So first, as, as I mentioned, when the higher frequency we go, already 3.5 gigahertz, the antennas get smaller, you can afford to include more antennas in the, in the devices. And uh, not to mention the millimeter waves, uh, then, then the antennas are really small, and, and you can expect the devices have even the multiple set of antennas in, in them. Beamforming allows to boost the capacity, as you can imagine, that instead of having just one sector covering, for example, this building from the outside base station, uh, you can have uh, inside the sector different beams that, uh, that have some isolation among themselves and, uh, and, and really focus the transmission for that particle user or group of users uh, needing data at given time. And that is the way, like, uh, uh, dividing this, uh, this um, basically like if you think about sector, something similar in that similarity, if you would think the idea that we go from three sector cell to six sector cells, we are splitting, splitting this kind of smaller pieces, the resources in, uh, in, 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 in space and frequency domain. Uh, also with the beam forming, then when instead of not sending for the same sector or full sector meaning, indeed we focus the energy, we send the same amount of, amount of energy, but focus in a narrower direction, not over 120 degrees, but maybe 10, 20 degrees, uh, if you think about this 360 site. And that allows, of course, us have a better link budget and compensate a loss that we get as to, with the higher frequencies. As you recall, the higher frequency band, the higher is the attenuation you get for your link budget. To deal with this uh, uh, beamforming operation, uh, we typically apply this kind of hybrid, hybrid beamforming, especially with the high frequency bands. So uh, 
That means that the base station can only transmit at one direction at a time. So one beam can be active at a time. And that means that we need this kind of special measures also to be able to figure out which beam is the best one for a different particle device. And uh, that's what we have this what we call the beam sweeping, which means that we are uh, transmitting one beam direction at a time and uh, device will measure is it beam zero, is it beam four, is it beam five, what is the beam that I receive the best, simply meaning what is the strongest for me and give that feedback for the network and network then can use that beam for the device in, 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 in the next transmissions. And that allows that uh, we have this kind of continuous tracking when devices move around in the, in the area that is, that is served by multiple beams. Devices themselves can have directivity as well in the millimeter wave, but uh, that's more, more detailed discussion on that one. On this kind of uh, MIMO technology, multiple input, multiple output, we have a lot of different alternatives. If going into the deep details, it would be maybe a lecture of its own on, on, on the MIMO, but uh, we can operate. This operation is often based on this uh, CSI, RS, so channel state information reference signals that the devices measure and give feedback for the network so that the network can configure the best possible beam forming transmission. We can have one of those or we can have multiple those depending what kind of beam forming array we have available in the, in the base station side. And then the device measures, is told what is in use, measures all of those and then provides feedback, suggestions that okay, what kind of transmission would be good for me in a given point in time. For TDD bands, other element to use is this channel reprocity, which means that because now we are using the same spectrum and same, same piece of spectrum for both terminal transmission and reception, which means that the signal then typically propagates, of course, roughly the same route for both for transmission and reception when we are talking about the same part of the spectrum. And that's why there, the possibilities uh, is, uh, is also used things like uh, sounding reference signals. Device can, uh, can also send this kind of known data for, for, for the network and the network can measure that and uh, based on that figure out what kind, of, uh, what kind of beam forming to use to reach that particle device. Sounding reference signals, that's what they are used for. When you go to this um, uh, millimeter waves, again, we will have a lot of different implementation choices. Uh, one may do this kind of single panel array that is basically able to, uh, with this uh, polarization, maybe able to deal with uh, this uh, transmit uh, diversity, create uh, two different MIMO streams, but only one device at a time. We can do this kind of uh, multi-panel array situation that can serve maybe one device with, uh, with uh, basically multiple beams or more MIMO streams, but typically the devices don't do many MIMO streams on the millimeter wave because it's, it's not so beneficial, but more advantage solution is actually then when you have multiple panels to use it as a multi-user MIMO that you try to seek this kind of device, devices like pairs or more than one device that maybe they are a little bit in the other end of the area you are serving and simultaneously you send one beam towards the other device, other beam towards the other device and serve them simultaneously and that way increase the sector peak throughput but not of course the individual device peak throughput but you are able to serve more devices in, in, in a given point in time. And then for that one you have indeed the same solutions. You can have this uh, channel state information, you can use the channel sounding reference signals, but typically the higher frequencies you go, then more beams you can em enable also from the implementation point of view, as well as from the standards point of view, the low frequency bands typically support 
only four or eight beams to be used, while higher frequency bands can go uh, uh, up to 64 beams or even higher in the, in the practical implementations as well as from the specification support. For the layer one channel structures, uh, uh, basically we have this set of channels in use. We have uplink shared channel, we have downlink shared channel, terms known from the, from the LT side as well. Physical broadcast channel is to send the necessary broadcast information. There's a downlink control channel, physical downlink control channel, PDCCH. Uh, same way uplink direction, we have physical uplink control channel, PUCCH, and then the PRAT uh, random access channel for contact, contacting the network in the, in the first place before you have a connection up and running. And then we have physical signals, many of them known from, from the LT side. Some of them are new, like these phase tracking reference signals needed for the millimeter meter wave operation, otherwise pretty familiar from the earlier technology. Reference signals uh, for channel estimation or channel state information reference signals for uh, getting measuring the channel and providing feedback for the network. And then this PSS and SSS are the primary and secondary synchronization signals those are the ones you use to find the cells in the first place. Uh, for the synchronization and broadcast operation, uh, we have this thing called uh, SS block, and, uh, and, and that is the one that the devices will seek first. So this is this used to identify devices to identify what is, what is the cell, so they find that from this primary and secondary synchronization signals, they get these things called physical cell ID, identify the cell, and then this uh, broadcast channel gives the necessary parameters to access the network. And uh, uh, for example, where do I find the random access channel and, uh, and other network parameters. And this sync block is indeed, when we have this earlier, what I saw the beam sweep, is the sync block, this is what we send periodically to, the, to each of the beams. This is what the devices measure based on this one, what they, is, is they find the network in, in the first place. For downlink channels, physical downlink control channel, PDCCH, this is in the first part of the frame in, in downlink direction. So uh, first comes control information, then comes the reference data, and then comes the actual PDCSH symbol, so physical downlink share channel. And uh, we have a different formats for physical downlink share channel, simply uh, to use basically as a link adaptation. If we have device next door to the base station, we don't need a lot of uh, channel coding because we have a very strong signal in that case. On the other hand, if a device at the cell edge, then we want to protect the signaling well because uh, and, and use a lot of redundancy for the channel coding. As like every system, if you lose the control signaling that tells you what you are supposed to receive in the first place, then of course it doesn't matter how well we send the data itself because the device will not know it's coming. So that tells indeed whether there's data coming for a particle device and where in the, for example, 100 megahertz carrier this data is, is located. Uh, physical downlink share channel then, then, uh, then, then comes after. Uh, now I also have shown here the example of this uh, uh, demodulation reference signals that come after the control channel and then rest of the symbols is used for this PDSCH unless we would have this additional demodulation and reference signal in place. We have four different modulation size. So we have the QPSK 16COM, 64COM and the 256COM. And now in release 17 we are adding for downlink also this 1024COM modulation, mainly beneficial for this kind of fixed wireless type of access operation when you have a really good signal signal conditions. 
a specific thing shown here on, on, in, in blue color. You see this uh, continuous line. So that is this uh, phase tracking reference signals that would be in, in place to allow uh, the device uh, to deal with this uh, phase noise, to have this kind of known, uh, known signal there in, in the millimeter, oper millimeter wave operations. Clearly, on this kind of smaller frequency, lower frequency bands, smaller than six, or maybe based on the release, uh, uh, release 16, I could say below below seven gigahertz, uh, you, you don't need this uh, naturally, as as you don't have such a problem with the phase noise. On the uplink direction, we have this uh, uplink uh, PUSCH physical uplink share channel. So first of all, the uplink transmissions uh, with, the, with the exception of the control channel, but for data is always based that we got, get the permission from the base station when we can transmit in time domain and where in frequency domain. This allocation could be something that uh, 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 could be like repetitive allocation sometimes but quite often it's, it's, it's dynamic to, to really not book the resources just in case. And that comes on the downlink control channel as, as, as well. And uh, then in uplink direction, we can have uh, uh, also, also, also uh, the single carrier transmission besides the off DMA in, in place. On the modulation sites, it's the same set of modulations, but for this log peak to average ratio case, when you are the cell edge, we also have this pi over 2 PPSK in, in, in place. And then the device will then send this uh, UE specific uh, demolus and reference signal so that the base station, on the other hand, can, can decode the data. Uh, physical uplink control channel is something that carries uh, uplink uh, control information. Uh, if you are sending uplink data, then of course you multiplex this together with, uh, with the uplink data transmission, but you need to be also able to send uplink control information uh, when you don't have uh, uplink allocation. So then you can of course send only control information where the key message is that things like, okay, my previous packet failed or, or, or did not fail and uh, or other way around that uh, now I, I have data in my buffer. So to, to have this kind of uh, request to get resources allocated. Further in uplink channels, so we have this uh, uh, PRATS, physical random access channel. And, uh, and here, the beamforming comes to the play. So now that uh, beamforming is there from the day one, so that means that devices need to figure out uh, uh, not only from the broadcast channel that what is, what is the resource to use for the random access, but also the devices do need to measure what is the best beam I should use. So now actually I need to select such a random access resource that is occurring uh, in, in, in the beam that I measure that is best for me. And all this kind of that, that kind of information you get from the broadcast channel transmission. Uh, that what are the resources, and then I figure out, for example, in here that uh, if this uh, beam number uh, five is the best for me, then I select such a random access resource that I know that when I send it, the base station is listening the beam direction number five, because otherwise, of course, my random access resource will will be wasted. But all that when it has been taken into account from the day one allows then to fully benefit from the beamforming, including when I'm accessing the network, it allows me the network to then direct the beam to the direction that I am. And then I get this maximum link budget also from a random access operation. Because otherwise, if the random access would be then this omnidirectional channel, but then otherwise I would be using beamforming and then it could be a situation that the data connection could be maintained, but I don't, I don't reach the network because my beamforming, uh, beamforming doesn't support random access operation. 
But that's why it was important that beamforming was there from the day one, part of, part of the design, as these kind of things are often difficult, if not even impossible, to add afterwards for the system. So now here also you have the term beam association visible, which means basically that in downlink, if I receive the beam number five being the best, then indeed in uplink I should understand that uh, uh, that this is what I use in the random access. And then ideally also when you think about the millimeter wave, if there's some directivity in the handset, it should understand that if there's particle direction where my best beam is coming, if I have any directivity, I should also direct my transmission to the same direction and not somewhere totally different. So that's the meaning of the beam association in, in, in that sense. So what are then the first phase uh, devices all about? So, uh, so basically the first phase devices that came to the market uh, 2019, they were supporting already, which was the first mode of 5G operation, this kind of dual connectivity. Uh, they, they, that was referred like non-standalone 5G that you first had to access 5G, uh, sorry, LTE, and then when there's enough stuff to transmit, then the 5G was activated on the side. The current set of devices, including the example devices on the slide and what I'm having here, this is like a Nokia 8.3 5G. So they do support the standalone 5G operation, which means that networks that are now moving to this, that you can directly access 5G, you don't have to first call via LTE or you don't need to have LTE on, on, on the connection active. That will, uh, that will allow uh, also smaller latencies. You get all the 5G benefits, faster connection setup when you don't have to go through, through LTE. And then when you do a test, you don't get all only high, higher data rates, but, uh, but indeed uh, the part of the packet then does not go through via LT, 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 LT channels, then that allows that uh, the latency overall is, is, is smaller. And we can get already in the market pretty high, high data rates. So, uh, uh, so, so this, uh, this example number taken, taken back home in, in, in my place uh, outside, of course, then I get this uh, nearly 900 megabits, but still also inside I get depending which room, six to 700 megabits uh, data rates, which is quite, uh, quite impressive, but uh, I happen to live relatively close to the one of the pay stations by one of the operators. And, uh, and uh, the devices indeed, they all support this um, in the European market. Uh, they typically indeed don't use the millimeter wave, but they support this 3.5 gigahertz band, often referred as a C band that uh, supports 100 megahertz carrier. It's a mandatory for device to support this 100 megahertz. It's mandatory for device to have a four receiver antennas. So that gives this kind of device capability in the order of two gigabits as a peak data rate. That could be achievable basically that if I was the only user in, 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 in for that base station and, uh, and very close to the base station, uh, I cannot get that kind of data rates myself. For, for a given reason that of course my subscription has some limits that uh, will not give me two gigabits. So, so that then there's no point for me going even closer to the base station as, as then my subscription will start, uh, start uh, limiting this. But, uh, but uh, at least in my case, I can see that uh, I, I'll get quite impressive speeds and uh, I'm going to ditch my ADSL connection that gives me 10 times less in, in, in very near term, term in the future, as soon as I get rid of my existing DSL contract. And uh, in the US market, indeed, the devices support this uh, uh, millimeter wave operation with two receiver antennas. You don't get, even the antennas are very small, you don't get that much diversity in, in, in the channel you get with this 28 gigahertz because propagation is such that if the signal reflects somewhere far, it gets already then so much attenuation. So that's why it's a two-stream MIMO only for the millimeter waves. But, um, but
but of course the bandwidths are larger. Devices support 400 or up to 800 megahertz of bandwidth and there you can get this kind of in the order of 4 to 5 gigahertz, uh, sorry, gigabits uh, data rates uh, possible with that kind of deployments. But in most markets the millimeter wave is still coming and also on the standard side we are still doing a lot of improvements to make the millimeter wave operation even more efficient and more reliable but with the millimeter wave of course it will be more for the hotspot uh, more local as, as, as the coverage on the millimeter wave is going to be limited and like in this kind of campus you would really need indoor base stations from the outside it doesn't really come through the walls in, in practice well and so this is then spilled basically the summary what I have described. So we have a high performance radio in, in, in place, also supporting the millimeter wave, but those come later, especially to European market. And uh, all devices support the dual connectivity. Now later, the standalone 5G operation, and we enable really high data rates, low latency with this. And uh, we expect many different uses in the industrial case in, in the future. Uh, then final remark is that uh, if you think 5G is your thing, you are eager to learn, not only here in, in, in Alta University, but in the future a part of your career. Also from our side, we are continuously hiring, hiring people, people for Nokia, getting new talents to work on this exciting developing of, of 5G. So please follow our offering. Here are a couple of examples available as of today. Thank you very much.